Gemma Tetlow. I'm Chief Economist here at the IFG. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening to hear from Matthew Vickerstaff, who is the interim CEO of the Infrastructure and Projects Authority and the head of the government uh, project delivery function. We're delighted um, to be partnering with Oracle, who are funding this series of events on professionalism within Whitehall. Um, and before I hand over to Matthew, it's worth highlighting that the IFG has a long-standing interest in the project delivery function and the wider professional agenda across Whitehall. Um, so back in September 2017, again with funding from Oracle, the IFG produced a report called Professionalising Whitehall, which was our stock take of the ongoing efforts to professionalise key functions within a Whitehall, including things like project delivery and financial management. And in that report, we called for greater representation of those kind of specialists in the top jobs within the civil service, not just for the sake of diversity, but to ensure that people with those operational expertise are being heard at the top table. And another aspect of our work which touches on this area is our annual Whitehall Monitor report, which is a data-driven analysis of the size and shape of government. And in that, we analyse delivery of major projects, which obviously um, is very much in Matthew's area of interest. And earlier this year, we highlighted that the fact that there are now over 300 Brexit-related programmes of work going on within government to prepare for all sorts of possible different scenarios, often to different different changing timescales and that government departments are trying to deliver that alongside more than a hundred other major projects including things like high-speed rail and universal credit. So despite increased efforts to improve project delivery within government we have highlighted the growing risk of things not being delivered on time or to budget and therefore very interested to hear from Matthew this evening about how all of those efforts are coming together. Before I hand over to Matthew, I'd just like to hand, now hand over to Gary Much, who is the Director of UK Government Affairs at Oracle, so a few opening words. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I lead the Government Affairs portfolio in Oracle, and so let me just start by making a, saying a public thank you to Gemma and the IFG team for hosting uh, these events. This is the fourth of five events. We have another one um, in, in April, and also producing, co-partnering with us, the, uh, the excellent report you just referred to in terms of professionalisation of Whitehall. Um, by way of introduction, I'd just like to maybe ask two questions and say, why is this important to Oracle? Um, Oracle has 800 plus public sector customers from large central government Whitehall-based bodies all the way down to local government, healthcare trusts and the like. 80% um, of the FTSE 100 are Oracle customers. And many of those customers are using finance, procurement, contracting, and even project and program management tools of ours. So we do have a uh, a sort of an enterprise-wide view. Many of these are delivered through our partners. So that's the Oracle interest. Why is it maybe this of interest to government now? Um, clearly, many of us are aware of the sort of Carillion collapse from last year and the, um, the decision-making and the contract process that was put under the microscope following that uh, has led to some excellent work and some revision in terms of how we manage risk and manage major programmes um, from, from within the Cabinet Office, and there's some interesting um, work that's come out of them. So um, we think this is important now, and I'm delighted that um, Matthew was able to come and speak at this particular forum. Um, he joined the uh, Infrastructure Projects Authority in 2016 as the Deputy CEO. He's now the Interim CEO. He has a banking and investment background, but also, as I've just heard, a, a fairly um, uh, impressive CV in terms of major UK projects and global projects. So we're delighted to have you here and we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will, I will try and catch up both of those uh, questions as, as we go through later. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me start by saying I'm really honoured to be here in the IFG. Um, it's an excellent opportunity to share thoughts and actually hear some questions, but also this evening to get my point across in terms of what the project delivery function is. Um, because the project delivery function is there to help ensure that best outcomes for project delivery across the whole of government happen. And we've made excellent progress in that area. But there's still a lot to do to ensure that, the, that we're a world-leading project delivery system. 
And I guess it would be remiss of me not to mention and acknowledge concerns that we have on some major projects right now, such as Crossrail, and I will come on to that later. But the project delivery system is not only the projects and profession we have, but also the standards and charters we adhere to, how we translate policy into project delivery, and how we define the ways of working, as well as the capability and resilience of our supply chains. All of that together is the project delivery system. And really, that's the focus of my speech this evening. And I'd, I'd like to focus on four key areas. Our vision for the future, suggestions for how we should prepare, prepare for what is a pretty critical time, some reflections and, as I said, lessons learned from recent project performance. And then perhaps most importantly, how we need to work at a system level rather than just a project level. So firstly, our vision for the future. We're currently delivering projects worth over £450 billion, the scope and scale of which frankly rivals the private sector and some of the biggest in the world. Government is a delivery orientated organisation with project delivery at the heart of all government activity. And really delivering projects is what government does. But we need to lift up our gaze from the immediate, immediate task of delivering projects and improve the way projects are delivered across our system. And as I said, aspire to be the best performing project delivery system in the world. And the government, the government centre for this is the IPA. So we all already have a relatively mature and highly effective project delivery system and, and function in government where we rely upon the Green Book, uh, Treasury's Green Book, we have lots of assurance uh, procedures that we, the IPA, carry out. We also have the government's major project, Leadership Academy, with the Side Business School in Side Business School in Oxford, and we have in robust infrastructure planning through the the construction pipeline and the National Infrastructure Delivery Plan, and frankly, lots more in terms of what the project delivery function has already within government. But project delivery isn't just about Gantt charts and risk registers. It's also about leading teams, managing stakeholders, communications and supply chains as well, as you refer to. And despite our successes, we still have a long journey to go. We're at a critical time, which is why we need to up our game. It goes without saying that EU exit has presented and will continue to present some interesting challenges. Um, ironically, it's also presenting and creating opportunities. The complexity of Brexit is making us think through delivery problems in different and new ways, and what we are doing now will create lessons for the future. It's also forcing government, frankly, to be better joined up both across departments and also across functions as well. This won't stop in the future, it will only increase. And again, that is a core activity and role of the functions to join government up and join the departments up. We're also going to be trying to address many of the common delivery challenges in the upcoming spending review. Um, we'll ensure that project delivery expertise will be at the core of spending decisions. And I was really encouraged that the Chancellor is making deliverability a cornerstone of the next SR. And we're seeing a real cultural change across government, which is very welcome. Very different from SR 15, deliverability will be at the core of SR 19. Now, I mentioned earlier recent announcements regarding the delayed opening uh, and increased cost of Crossrail, as well as costs escalation 
on HS2. They epitomize really the challenges facing the delivery of major infrastructure projects in the UK. But I would say these, these uh, challenges can also be opportunities. Um, by making sure we're learning the right lessons from projects that have gone before and embedding those lessons into the system going forward, we can help transform project delivery across government. As you'd expect, the IPA has, wor has been working with the Department for Transport, doing a lot of inter internal analysis on, recent, on these recent major projects and trying to work on lessons learned. Rather than a forensic analysis of each of the individual projects, which I guess has really been undertaken elsewhere, this work has been deliberately system related and again focusing on what we can do at the system level and implement uh, as a function. I'm not going to go into too much detail now, but I'm happy to take questions later. There are a few lessons learned, though, that I would like to share with you. And the first of those is really, and this is absolutely crucial, behaviours behaviors in project delivery and the overall culture are more important than process. It's a really, really important thing that we really has, have to grasp. Um, what, what the projects show is that you can have the best, most well-designed governance structure in the world, but what really it comes down to is the behaviours and, and, and culture of the people delivering the projects. Things like groupthink and a blind commitment to succeed without a balanced overall perspective on project delivery can definitely lead to the wrong behaviours and fundamentally decisions on major projects. And again, it's so important to change that culture and to get that behavioural thing right. But those, those, those kind of practices and processes and behaviours aren't really easily fixed. Um, and again, even with clear accountabilities and structural checks and balances, really difficult to, to land. The most important thing, I think, really is the need for transparency and a change in behaviour especially when there are multiple stakeholders involved, which is absolutely critical to have that transparency, openness and, and common working. Moving on also, we've got to pay greater attention to systems and systems integration. We see that projects uh, at the IPA across all sectors, including infrastructure, need more emphasis on managing increasing technical complexity. System integration failures present late in the project life cycle, but we need to establish the conditions for success right at the start. An increasing dependence on technology and greater complexity will create new and additional delivery risks. It seems obvious, but we're just seeing an increasing level of complexity technological risk and overall systems integ integration being absolutely critical for the success of projects. And we need to invest in people with the skills to manage these risks and attract them to the construction industry which has been associated with, shall we say, concrete and diggers for far too long. We need to upskill the people involved in delivering uh, our infrastructure projects. I would say as well there are other factors, of course, that uh, it's worth acknowledging, such as optimism bias, that schedules can be achieved or recovered when in reality they can't. Again, that comes back to behavioural issues. And it's just worth acknowledging that delivering projects of this size and complexity is, is difficult and complex and requires a heroic effort from all involved. While it's tempting to search for a single process that failed or point a finger at a particular person or people responsible, the, the reality is that there are no real easy fixes and there's no silver bullets. We have to concentrate on getting the basics right, learning the right lessons, and in embedding them, as I say, in the system for the future. And we're very conscious that lessons uh, identification is the easy part. 
It's much more difficult to apply them in practice, and that is what we will be focusing on moving forward. And I guess that, that really brings me back to the wider, the wider system. And I'd like to define in a bit more detail really what, what I mean by the system and, and how we should change treating individual projects as individual projects and looking at them in the whole, in the system as a whole. I think, as I, as I said already, we've made remarkable progress uh, in the function, a function in the IPA. <coughs> Frankly, we're constantly visited uh, by foreign, foreign uh, parties, so I, I can think of India, Brazil, Hong Kong, China, um, Australia, the US, who are actually extremely interested in how the IPA is set up and are looking at forming their own uh, IPA uh, clone in their own countries. <coughs> and we're, we're globally renowned for our projects, and I would say the future is, is, is basically bright. But in order to improve performance, we've identified four key system changes that we will be focusing on, and I'll just run through these. First, we need to choose the right projects. This means a renewed effort on proper prioritization and portfolio management. This will enable us to better match projects with resources and avoid over-programming. Again, the spending review and EU exit are already forcing us to prioritize, and this is a good thing. The IPA is also establishing its own portfolio management capability and will be supporting departments in developing their own as well. Second, then, we need to set up those projects for success. We've already paid a lot of attention to proper initiation, but we've got to take this to the next level. Um, we need to cross the valley of death between policy creation and delivery, and this means bringing them closer together so we can set realistic objectives, costs, and schedules up front. Again, the focus on deliverability is core and key. Crossrail, again, is a good example of this, where having a rigid completion date set early on as part of the policy can lead to problems and compression down the line. Third, we must hold ourselves to account through transparent performance measurement. I know this is something the IFG uh, will be pleased to hear, uh, and I think there might be a question coming. Uh, we we, we recognise that understanding how projects deliver against, against promises is crucial. It helps us feed back into the system and improve performance over time. So we already publish annual transparency data on how the government's most complex and high-risk projects are progressing. I think many of you will be aware of the GMPP. But the IPA will continue to share lessons we're learning with departments so there's a common and transparent view between departments and the centre. And I guess going back to that behavioural thing, it does require us to be open, collaborative and honest with each other. So last but no means least, we must have the right people working on the right projects. This is fundamentally what our project delivery profession is about. And Fiona Spencer is here. Please chat to her later. She leads our project delivery profession, which rather than the function is all about our people. And we're now 11,000 strong across all of government with 20 heads of profession across the departments. Over 1,000 project leaders have been through the major projects leadership academy and the PLP to date. And project delivery is now the third most popular career path for Fastream, and really interestingly and positively, over 50% or around for 50% are, are women. So it's a, a really important functional activity which is really attracting talent from a diverse uh, background. And fundamentally, we know that great leaders deliver great projects, so we must continue this work, ensure we have the most experienced leaders delivering the, our most complex projects. So, 
To conclude, these four areas, prioritisation, initiation, performance and capability, are not new, but they are the basics that we need to get right. It's a critical time with a majority and a major, uh, sorry, a major opportunity of the spending review and EU exit, actually creating a catalyst to focus our delivery activities and change the way we work. We need to improve, as I've said, the project system for the long term and react and stay ahead of our changing environment. My point on technology and systems integration risk. And this requires us to learn the right lessons and also requires us to actually ensure that we put those lessons into practice, which is one of the biggest challenges. The IPA has got a unique position at the centre of government to help, but it is for the whole of the function and the wider industry and stakeholder community, such as yourselves as well, to support us with this. And with those comments, I would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Before I throw it open to the floor, I'll ask a few of my own questions to you first. Um, so you talked there about um, the project delivery profession being the third most popular career choice now for fast-stream economists yeah. coming in. Um, and we obviously at the IFG, as I said, have pushed in the past for greater representation of those specialists at the top levels in Whitehall. What do you think are the prospects for someone going into the project delivery today? How likely are they to get to the top levels of Whitehall and what are you doing to help enable that? So we, we um, a absolutely there is the potential to get to the top of Whitehall. I, I would say, and, and as I said in my speech, government delivers projects. I mean, that's what it does. And, and we've, I talked to quite a lot about infrastructure projects, but from a defence perspective, from transformation, so Oracle will clearly be interested more in our, our transformation and I, IT, transformational projects, and if anything, we're seeing greater reliance upon that type of structural change and transformation of the processes that we undertake. And somebody coming in as a fast streamer will obviously go into the civil service machine, but the, the programs and practices that we have in place, so the standards that we now have, but also the learning courses that we have, like the Major Projects Leadership Academy and also other leadership courses with Side Business School are recognised and renowned as the best in the world. So we have an MOU, we've signed an MOU with Hong Kong who want to replicate that <coughs> for their civil servants as well. The area that we are improving, and this is a key task of Fiona, is on our project delivery academy. So those fast streamers coming in will get absolutely absorbed into our project delivery standards and our uh, teaching and processes and practices, but we are trying to increase and improve our offer at the more junior band levels. So absolutely, your question was, can you go through the MPLA? Basically, most SROs have all been on the MPLA. They've all had that learning, improved their capability, but we also need to make sure that we feed that people through by increasing our project delivery uh, academy, which is essentially leaning in on already teaching and activity that's happening across departments already, but on a franchise model, so that we actually ensure that it's joined up between different departments. So there are programs across all of government to help the project delivery uh, function and professionals actually achieve. Can I get back to something you mentioned in your remarks about the importance of prioritising projects? And could you say a bit more about what the IPA is doing to help the government over the next spending review period to prioritise, particularly given the competing challenges with Brexit and all the other things that government needs to do? Yes. So I think the core, the core and key thing actually is, is deliverability. I mean, we're... We're very, we're very conscious, of, when, we, when we all go into budgeting processes, one, one always has a kind of 
a story, a business case, which obviously has commercial investment, um, overall ambition, and when we look at reference class forecasting, when we look at optimism bias, that's the type of activity that we all know is absolutely essential in delivering good projects. And that's, it's important to go through that process to check the overall deliverability of policies that are put forward by departments. So that deliverability thing is key. In terms of prioritisation, this is more actually looking at projects and programmes as a portfolio. You've got to match your activity to your capability. And that could be capability of your experts, the number of people in terms of departments who can deliver projects, but also your supply chains as well. Actually, how many suppliers, what can, how many contracts can you enter into without stressing the system too much? And actually, how can you ensure that as you manage your portfolio, that you have enough bandwidth and you stage and prioritise things over periods to ensure that you can deliver things well rather than delivering lots of things below par. So that portfolio management, which is partly prioritisation, but prioritisation is also deliverability and portfolio management, we think are absolutely critical as we go into uh, the spending review process. But actually, Part of that will be revi revisiting the government's major project portfolio, so what we already have underway, which we've then added to with Brexit as well. Talking about Brexit, because we can't really have an event without talking seriously about Brexit, probably the biggest delivery challenge over the past couple of years for many government departments has been preparing for the possibility of a no-deal Brexit, and despite yesterday's vote, that remains a possibility. What have the IPA and the project delivery profession been doing to help departments to prepare for that quite big project challenge? So really, for two years now, we've been absolutely immersed in uh, EU exit uh, preparation and delivery. And what, what we did uh, about 18 months ago was did an assurance review of the most critical, important projects and programmes that the de departments were delivering to be prepared for a no-deal Brexit. And then also moving on from that, how those would have to be evolving into business as usual. So those most complex, difficult, novel and contentious as you look at them, they have different reasons for being complex. It might be the impact, it might be the systems, it might be the processes that actually need to be re-engineered to be delivered. And we've been involved in that process, as have all of the other functions now across government, as we've all worked together to actually make sure that we are prepared for a no-deal Brexit. As you say, the vote yesterday appears to suggest that we're not going down a no-deal Brexit. Actually, it's really difficult. And one of, the, one of the problems that we have is that we still have to be prepared for a no-deal scenario, even though it would appear that the politicians do not want that. And that's just the political complexity that we're in. So the question I warned you I was going to ask you before, as you alluded to in your remarks. So you've obviously been doing this analysis of no-deal preparations, but you haven't given the sort of public rag rating that you do for the major projects portfolio. Do you think that there should be greater transparency and openness about the degree of preparedness in, in those areas? So we, we absolutely, what we, we have done is, is rag rated all of those uh, 50 projects and there's actually some more now as we've really got close to in, in terms of the, the testing, etc. that we've been doing. Um, we have also actually take, undertaken uh, what we call follow-up assurance activity plans, so actually checked in that our recommendations that we put forward, have they actually been implemented? So we've undertaken AAPs as well as we've got closer uh, to, the, to the dates. I don't think it's really for me uh, to comment on whether Brexit detailed negotiations and systems related things and things of complex technological risk in terms of implementation should be transparently shared. It is, 
It is a fact that some of the issues are and should remain, I think, confidential. Um, I can only assure you that we've certainly been working on those issues. We are pro-transparency, as we have with the GMPP, but I think there are some things which really it's not for me to comment on in terms of uh, their importance and severity, frankly, to the, to the nation. You mentioned in your remarks um, the, the issue of tackling optimism bias, and that's obviously something the IPA have been working uh, to deal with. Is there any evidence that plans are becoming less optimistic over time? Can you point to anything where you think actually we're, we've got greater realism in the planning stage? Oh, yes, I, I just throw. I think we need to we need to focus on optimism bias. We also need to focus on hindsight bias, and, and I'd include organisations like IFG in that actually, and the ANAO, because it's quite good and, and often hindsight bias is used quite a lot, and it's. It's a really interesting topic to actually study and actually think through what would I have done and where would I have been. But having made that kind of free comment, <laughs> um, I, think, I think we are, we are somewhat better at optimism bias analysis. But it is really, it's really tough. I mean, I, I recently saw a Monte Carlo risk analysis about and benefits analysis. I know that Monte Carlo risk analysis, just a random number generator, you create a probability distribution and you, you can kind of use science to deliver an art. So it does come down to detailed analysis challenge looking at the different options and risk analysis, etc. Are we better? I think we are, because for some of the reasons we are learning, trying to learn lessons. And other activities that the IPA is undertaking are things like performance benchmarking. So we are trying to use history, cost benchmarking, to actually inform future decisions, both at the policy level, the delivery level, and then actually checking in to say, how are we progressing when we look at cost evolution and benchmark them against previous uh, experience? Are we in the right ballpark? And I think, you know, why I slightly hesitate, because I think you can always identify s scenarios and situations where there has been optimism bias, and sometimes it's been almost intentional to get a project approved and across the line. But I think we're very much aware of it, and we're trying to keep that discipline challenge, which I think is essential. That you made a very interesting point in your remarks about the importance not just having the right systems and processes in place, but the right behaviour and culture within the teams. What do you think is your role in setting that behaviour and delivering on setting the right culture to, to make sure that that actually have things work in practice? I, I, think, I think it is something where the IPA does need to think through in terms of providing insurance reviews. Often there is, there is great work. There, is, there are very detailed plans, great governance structures. It appears that things are progressing well, that risk risks are being managed well, flagged. But we've all been in, in a major project where actually there is an elephant in the room where you can see that actually this still does not feel right. It's still, although all the, all the data, all the systems are spewing out saying this is, it doesn't. So I think often perhaps the IPA's role, but P reps role, so program representatives, I was talking with a major uh, global uh, engineering company who said, look, we, we often feel we need to change our culture as well. It's industry as well that needs to change their culture. And contractors to say, look, we're not just going to say to the client, we'll catch up, we can deliver, but actually to raise the red flag and say, look, we, this, this really does feel as if we need to have a reset, a rebaselining, or, or actually really apply more resources to catch up. You also talked about the importance from your side of helping government to join up across departments, so deliver not in departmental silos. Is there anything you could point to experience in the past, 
accepting, <coughs> we don't want to look back to history, um, where that's actually really worked very well, where you've helped government departments to work outside their silos? I, I think we're actually doing that almost every day. I mean, we, we, are, we are in a very privileged position because uh, functionally we report into the Cabinet Office, but we also have a reporting line into Treasury. And being, being at the heart of the Cabinet Office was, as, as it were, the Prime Minister, so that's where all the policy flow is coming through, but then with the realism and the financial discipline of Treasury, um, we, we, we're joining up every day between departments and Treasury and making sure that that is happening. I think specific examples, um, and one we're really proud of is EU exit, actually, because we flagged very recently, in fact it was Tony Meggs who, who flagged, this is a project, it's a program that we need to create work streams around and actually create a delivery mentality about. And that, that was something really that the IPA instigated and made happen very early on and has now gone into to process. The other one we're also really happy and, and, and I think proud about, is to answer your question, is actually getting deliverability on the agenda for this coming spending review. And that will be will be absolutely critical. So there's a, a rear view mirror and a and a kind of uh, windscreen mirror for you. Excellent. Well, thank you. With that, I will open up to questions from the, the audience. Uh, so at the back there was definitely the first hand to go up, and then we'll come over here as well. Uh, Mike Water from Transportation Professional Magazine. Um, staying on that theme, you spoke also about the. Uh, the, the, the group think or the blind commitment that can uh, lead to the wrong behaviours and sometimes the temptation to point the finger when things go wrong. You are, of course, talking about fundamental human behaviours, which are very difficult to change. I just wondered if you can give any simple, tangible examples of how major projects can turn around behaviours and are there any other sectors which are doing a good thing which have um, managed to turn around uh, this optimism bias that are doing better than perhaps transport? I, th I think on the, on, on the first, I, I think actually it is a, it's a role that non-exec directors can perform extremely well. If you, if you get a board that is able to challenge and is not necessarily in the day-to-day flow and therefore not as vested in the program or date that's been um, set. Um, it's a good way round of getting into that kind of, you know, blind commitment, we've got to deliver, we've got to deliver, just saying, look, it's obvious we can't. And often that just breaks the, the seal of everyone saying, no, you're right. Um, so non-exec directors, I think it's an opportunity for P reps uh, to, to step up. And I think, you know, frankly, it's also, there are times the IPA undertaking assurance reviews needs to think quite carefully about, you know, where we say, look, actually, this doesn't feel as if it's going to, to deliver um, in accordance with either the cost schedule or, 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 or the plan. So I think it's, because it's a behavioural issue, it's not one one individual, one type of entity, I think it, it needs to be delivered at the system level. Could I ask you to talk a bit more about the relations with the supply chain? I think we see a very different style very often between a big FTSE 100 prime having difficulty with its supply chain and the relationship that a government has with the supply chain. One is much more perhaps probing interventionist and, but also more friendly in a way, and the other is very stiff and formal. Can we talk a bit about that area? And secondly, what, what impact do you think the government commercial service is now having round the departments on this sort of area? Um, so there's two questions. It's government commercial function. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, I think in terms of the relationship with tier ones, tier twos, tier threes, I think undoubtedly one can't deny the fact that Carillion issues around fair payment, project accounts have really bubbled up 
uh, to the top of everybody's focus and agenda because of uh, the Carillion fallout. I, I would flag to you the great activity that is happening within government and hold that up as an example of what's going really well. So I think Highways England, with their alliance contracting and their relationship building, not just with the tier ones, but also tier twos, tier threes, and actually regional contractors who might be actually um, chap in a, a lorry who's actually starts building a business regionally and therefore is looking at rebalancing, that alliance contracting I think is working really well and I think there's things we can learn from that which they have learnt already from the water industry as well. Um, we are pushing as part of our transforming infrastructure performance agenda also modern methods of construction and that is very much about getting closer to industry and looking at innovative, more creative ways of delivering things, working with industry to actually deliver on a common agenda. And I think we're trying to work with industry to actually share innovation, share working practice, and ensure that we do change the dynamic between the you know, government has a relationship with a tier one who does low margin business who then passes on that low margin and risks to the supply chain which i think is uh, one could say part of how things have worked worked historically on the government commercial function i think they are doing a brilliant job of exactly what uh, was described earlier in terms of professionalizing the interaction uh, between governments and the private sector and the supply base. Um, so the, the roadmap that they have put forward is, is a, on, on outsourcing is an example of just improving the way that government interacts uh, with its suppliers. And that's, that's part of a long-term agenda to get away from government just looking at lowest costs but to drive value and actually having a supply chain and supply system which actually can make money, can make be profitable but can reinvest in skills, be innovative and improve productivity which as you know is the Chancellor's overall ambition. Tony? I'm Tony Travers from the LSE. I mean, you mentioned the National Audit Office. And I think it's fair to say that, certainly in my world view, we hear a great deal about the NAO Public Accounts Committee, how select committees, and particularly the PAC, struggle after the event to drive through the messages that come out of certainly the uh, more egregious failures and the question of how lessons are learned. and that. There's a kind of big literature and a big sort of, a uh, lot of thought goes on to that end, whereas you're coming at this from very much the sort of um, public health, the sort of let's stop it happening in the first place kind of way rather than when it's all gone wrong. So, which is noble. But with that in mind, so the question's going to get nasty now. <laughs> well, can you when, stop there? <laughs> when, when you get to high speed two, which is a real living example of a project which clearly costs a great deal of money, started as a political project, nobody really knows why it's being done. Uh, it's going to cost a very large amount of money and there's, it, it, you, you can see already there's just the slightest risk it might overrun the cost. Now, what's your, what's your I mean, what's the, you know, the Infrastructure and Projects Authority's role to guide that project or to, I mean, is it, how far can you get into a project of that kind in order to stop something slowly happening in front of us, which many people think might happen? So HS2, uh, as you know, HS2 Limited is obviously on the GMPP. Um, it is the delivery arm's length body responsible for delivering uh, that project. They have themselves said that they are under cost pressure. There is no open checkbook, though, 
and, and limitless checkbook for HS2. So I think undoubtedly those pressures are there, they've been accepted by HS2, and they are working with their suppliers to look at how they can actually rework, improve the likely overall uh, landing point in terms of the delivery of that project. We will continue to work with them. We, we check in from time to time, provide reviews. We're not doing that at the moment, but there is a point that we will do that as they work with their suppliers and actually land on what the target cost is for continuing with the project. And that was always in programme, the stage two contracts. They're just following the, the process. Um, but I think we will try and influence by ensuring that the, the project is delivered as well as it can be in the context of the proposals that are agreed between HS2 Limited and, and suppliers, which is part of the stage two construction contract letting process. But I mean, you can see the, the point of the, you know, the difficulty of the question, which is that as it's self-evidently likely to be difficult, I mean, will um, the IPA at, at any level, as it were, feel it's responsible if this project does run over, car, over budget or run late or not get delivered completely? I mean, it, it, I'm trying to work out exactly how deep into it the IPA can go. So we, we are we are working working through and are doing some analysis generally, not just relating to HS2, but projects across the whole landscape to actually understand in a lot more detail what are the drivers. It's not as simple as just saying costs are are going up. There are processes, program issues, approval uh, dynamics, which if you look back, need to be evaluated in terms of what is happening for projects such as HS2. And we kind of, that's why I, I mentioned we're kind of at a critical time because it's important to really form a view on that and that's exactly what we will do in the IPA and we will we will share that that view with decision makers etc but it is too early to jump to conclusions which I think you've kind of done but I can I can understand given the noise around the project where you might have done but we we will have to do the work to come to uh, our conclusions so there's one here first and then I'll go to the back yeah. Uh, Billy Roden from Midlands Connect. Uh, thank you, Matthew, and also thank you to your team who've helped us, uh, especially in the last year. Uh, we're promoting a scheme called the Midlands Rail Hub, uh, and your team have helped us look at it as a package to reduce the risk rather than just a, a one uh, major intervention. My question is the fundamental issue you raise, which is, is government trying to do too much itself, and does it really understand its role uh, as guardians of a system? Uh, I think the most obvious example is the rail timetabling issues last year, uh, where DFT wanted to see itself as the guardian of the system uh, and hold someone to account or an organisation to account, and on some issues found itself pointing in the mirror. Um, now, if it really wants to be guardian of the system, uh, it's also got to accept that other organisations are going to deliver things and be clients, but at the moment it doesn't really seem to accept that differentiation. Uh, and that's why we get into the confusing messes that we did last year. Government, government is, doing, is doing a lot. Government's doing a huge amount. Um, and government is very keen to invest in infrastructure. The Chancellor has set a 1.2% of GDP target to invest in infrastructure. So I'm sure you've seen our pipeline over the next 10 years. 600 billion at about 60 billion a, a year. Um, not all delivered by uh, government, around 50% of that delivered by the private sector. Um, I, I actually think your example is the wrong example uh, because that, that was about timetabling and, and, and 
franchising, etc. I've said we need to look at portfolio management and prioritisation, and that I think is critical, especially especially as we go into SR19. And portfolio management is an active process. It is an active process that says, okay, what do we already have in delivery and what are we trying to do in addition to that? And have we got things programmed so that we can match that demand and capability? So I, don't, I think it's a constant thing to be examining and looking at just as you know, businesses will look at, okay, what investment cases are they putting forward? Are they, are they actually achieving them? Are they making the returns that they need? Government, in terms of delivering its productivity ambitions, improving its infrastructure, constantly needs to, to think about whether it is uh, doing too much. Um, so, towards the back there. Uh, John Burt, House of Lords, can I start by applauding your <coughs> opening remarks and the professionalisation you're bringing to this important area. I have uh, two, two questions. Um, uh, I've been involved in many uh, major projects in, in my life, both in the public and private sector, and my main takeaway from all of them is how inherently difficult all large projects are, and if you manage them with uh, all the perfection that you want to bring, uh, they're still, for very, very good reasons, uh, are going to prove to be more difficult than people thought, and they will overrun, and they'll cost more than people thought. Uh, how, how do we approach that? I deeply disapprove of the hindsight merchants um, uh, myself, but how do we... In those so you disapprove of, I didn't of the hindsight merchants? Oh, the hindsight, so right, I, yes. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, how, how in those circumstances can we properly measure success? How can we stop politicians making, and I have direct experience of politicians out of the, uh, out of the air uh, producing uh, unrealistic deadlines for projects of that kind? That's my first question. My second question uh, is less sympathetic to um, to, to government, and I was heavily involved when I was in government myself in, in uh, major, uh, major projects, uh, but I've also had a lot of experience on the other side, and um, my insights may be slightly out of date, uh, things may be better, but my general experience is, is that, particularly on major IT projects, uh, governments are very, uh, very poor customers. Um, and they are poor customers for two reasons. One, uh, and I repeat, I've had very direct experience of this, uh, that, uh, particularly on IT projects, they simply don't play their part. The, um, the public sector, the public service, the line managers, whether it's doctors or whatever, simply don't collaborate properly with people who are contracted to, uh, to buy a service and those projects overrun. And then you come into the second problem, which is an increasingly professional commercial service within government, then treats those situations with high aggression, and you end up, because it's more, all more competitive, people taking on projects in very unsatisfactory circumstances, not um, uh, with low margins, no latitude, and uh, struggling to deliver them. And uh, things may have got better, but I think that 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 whole area of government does need a complete uh, refresh. So I, I think there were three questions. I don't know if you write them down. So I've got the, the project. I agree, projects are tough. Um, we're actually quite good at projects. I mean, it, it, you know, with, with there's, there's a feel, a little bit of a, mm, you know, but there's definitely. Uh, Perhaps the if you the high watermark was perhaps the Olympics and you know it had it had leadership it had it, it had a, an end date which had to be achieved so it kind of galvanised and brought everybody together and got those right behavioural experiences and and, and uh, behaviour as a, a whole had a very very f f targeted focus um, you know interesting. Crossrail has been an incredible delivery from a civil engineering <coughs> perspective and the massive complexity of the, the, the engineering and the tunnelling involved across 
in three sections, the whole, the whole of, of um, London. Um, and as I said, international countries, kind of countries come and look at us and say, these guys know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're actually, so we should be careful about not beating ourselves up too much. Um, on, 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 on IT, um, I do, I, I've got... How do you define Crossrail as a success? I agree with you, it is a great success, but it's now politically conceived as a failure. Because if you look at the number of people who are going to run, that's what I was getting at. How did we recognise that it was, it was a massively ambitious and difficult project which has succeeded, albeit overrun and overspent? I mean, I, you know, you, your, your opinion is, I, I, I think, is a, is a very valid, very valid opinion. And I, I'm, I'm really confident with Crossrail, having, having seen, seen it, when it is complete, it will be seen as a resounding success and a globally, you know, top tier piece of infrastructure, which, um, yes, Projects of that complexity are difficult, difficult to deliver. We perhaps, you know, setting a very firm date, so, you know, at the outset, which was highly ambitious, and then working back to that, rather than actually really saying, when can this be delivered, is something to reflect upon. But I am confident it will be delivered ultimately and it will be a, a high class, really uh, globally uh, significant piece of infrastructure. Um, on on our IT, I think government actually has got a lot better. That is an area where GDS, so Government Digital Service, has made a huge investment and Kevin Cunnington, who's uh, a peer of mine, and his team are making huge inroads in terms of professionalising and improving government's activity, not just in IT, but digital as a whole. Um, it is complex, so there are examples, of course, given government delivers so much, where there are some problems. Um, and I would say that's where the crossover between policy objectives, changing policy objectives, and delivering systems, one has to really keep things very much locked down. Uh, but I think there's a huge improvement in that area. Um, I think your final point was on profitability, so um, suppliers bidding for low margin contracts. I think, I think government is, is, is very comfortable and keen that its suppliers should be thriving, making profits, hopefully reinvesting in systems, in skills, and ensuring that it has a supplier base which is diverse and resilient. Um, whether that means that, you know, we've, we've changed an approach from lowest cost at all counts versus best value, can we get that balanced scorecard a bit better? Probably yes, but I think that, that area is, is improving. I am really sorry, but we are now out of time. So apologies to anyone who didn't manage to ask their questions. I'd just like to say thank you very much to Matthew for joining us this evening and sharing his thoughts. As Gary said at the start, this is the fourth in our series of uh, Whitehall Professions events. And the last in the series will be on the 25th of April with Chris Wormald, who will talk about the policy profession. But please just join me in thanking Matthew very much. Thank you.